Our keynote speaker for this evening, Lieutenant General, retired Gabi Ashkenazi. Gabi Ashkenazi began his military service in the elite Golani Infantry Brigade in 1972 and served in the Sinai Peninsula during the 1973 Yom Kippur War. In July 1976, he was a platoon leader in Operation Entebbe to rescue kidnapped Israeli hostages held in Uganda. He first served in Lebanon in 1978 during Operation Litani. During the 1982 war, Ashkenazi served as Deputy Commander of the Golani Brigade and was promoted to commander in 1986. In 1988, Ashkenazi was appointed Head of Intelligence for the Northern Command. In the early 1990s, he commanded a Reserve Armored Division and then went on to serve as Head of Israel's Lebanon Liaison Unit. In 1994, he was promoted to Chief of the General Staff of Operations Division and in 1996, he was promoted to the rank of Major General and to the position of Aide to Chief of the Operations Branch. In 1998, he was appointed GOC Northern Command, a position in which he oversaw Israel's withdrawal from the security zone in southern Lebanon, bringing an end to Israel's 18-year presence there. Appointed IDF Deputy Chief of Staff in 2002, Ashkenazi was in charge of the construction of the West Bank security fence erected to prevent terrorist attacks within Israel. He retired from the IDF in May 2005 when Dan Halutz appointed, was appointed IDF Chief of Staff. During those uh, years of retirement, by the way, he managed to do something very, very important for IDC Herzliya. He was the chairman of the security committee of IDC Herzliya. IDC Herzliya brings students um, every year, hundreds of students from elite combat units, Navy SEALs, F-16 pilots, folks from other elite units, and uh, Gabi Ashkenazi was the chairman of this committee which waived the entrance exams for hundreds of these students who came into IDC Herzliya, which makes IDC Herzliya so special. So uh, we're very grateful for you for doing that during that time, during that period of retirement. But Gabi Ashkenazi was appointed Director General of the Ministry of Defense in 2006. In February 2007, he was promoted to the rank of Lieutenant General and appointed 19th Chief of the General Staff of the Israeli Defense Forces, serving until February 2011. Ashkenazi is a graduate of the Command and Staff College of the IDF and the Command and Staff College of the United States Marine Corps in Quantico, Virginia. He also holds a BA in Political Science from Tel Aviv University and a degree in International Business Administration from Harvard University. Without any further ado, one of the finest chiefs of staff in the history of the IDF, Gabi Ashkenazi. Thank you very much. I found the introduction uh, very flattering and longer than my uh, presentation. <laughs> uh, I'm really proud uh, to be here uh, tonight and uh, Thanks for uh, the invitation to this important uh, convention. Um, being in a think tank in Washington, D.C., I'm a visiting fellow at the uh, Brookings Institute. Uh, I uh, learn the importance of such uh, events, uh, actually creating a community of knowledge, experience, and uh, crafting the uh, public agenda and recommending about policies and uh, maybe strategies and the way to deal with a very complex uh, problem, challenges, and the world. During the last uh, three months, being in Washington, D.C., um, it was a very eye-opening experience to me, being exposed to uh, a very... Uh, different issues, even if you are not a junkie of uh, uh, global uh, security issues, uh, the city is very uh, hospitable. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, meet uh, people um, from the private sector, the public sectors, and uh, from the hill, from both sides of the aisle, and from the defense establishment, and uh, I've learned uh, three things. One, that we Israelis tend to think that we understand everything and uh, I realize that we don't have a monopoly on, on the region and the knowledge and the smart 
people ideas regarding this issue that we're dealing with. So there is a lot to learn. Secondly, I changed my perspective. Being there, it's not a cliche to say that what you see from there, you don't see from here. Um, trying to look at the world from a perspective of a, a global superpower um, give you a different proportion about the priorities and uh, the complexity and the uh, huge, I think, challenge that the U.S. Uh, has in hand. And thirdly, understanding the uh, importance of these think tanks and this community, as they said in the beginning, in influencing the administration um, on policies and, and practice and other, and it's a culture which I, th I think we have to adopt it. So uh, I'm going to continue with this. I, uh, after experiencing uh, one earthquake quake, and uh, one hurricane storm, Irene, I decided to come to a more safer place, so I returned to Israel. <laughs> but I'm going to uh, go back. I, I was asked to speak about counterterrorism and about the situation around us, mainly the Arab Spring, and how it's connected to the uh, Israeli perspective. Although I'm sure that you would like to hear me on other subjects, and I'm going to uh, concentrate very briefly on these issues. And uh, uh, I like the second part of this uh, event when uh, we'll open up to uh, a question, and if I know the answer, I'll give you my best answer based on my knowledge and my view. About counterterrorism or fighting global war against the terror, I think after a decade, since the September 11, it's a perfect time to try from a very broad perspective to try to check the balance. What happened? And uh, I think very briefly that we have together achieved many achievements, although with a very high prices. I think the most important achievement is that we engage the idea with those on or in the radical Muslim world, the radical Islam, that they cannot gain any objective through using terror. I think that uh, Al-Qaeda, definitely the spearhead of this notion, it's a failure at the end of the day. I think it's happened even before the Bin Laden kill. I'm not underestimating Bin Laden, um, Al-Qaeda or Bin Laden, or what may happen. But I think basically the world, the West, are more aware, more willing, more determined, more organized, even in very operational way to deal with the threat. There is a lot more to do, but we are more cooperative. Organizations over the world are sharing information. The interoperability in each country and between countries are different. And more importantly, I think politicians understand the threat of terror and they decided to invest in it. Uh, some will argue that the price were too high. In the United States, the uh, last two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are in some places uh, uh, there are school of thought that uh, will argue if it was necessary or not. But I think the bottom line is that the West were determined to fight, and it's not the end of history as some try to predict. The danger is there exists, and we have to uh, sacrifice. And I found it very encouraging to learn that I think most of us and governments abroad understand the need. And it affects our relationship. Even with the IDF, there is more opening to increase relationship, to enhance cooperation when it's come to global terror. It's became a very common and mutual threat that enhance and uh, promote relationship, even with some of our surrounding country that otherwise I would not think may happen. Let's look what happened in Israel. 
At the beginning of the century, a decade ago, we were witness to unprecedented waves of terror. Nothing that we have experienced before. With uh, suicide bombs and others, buses were explo- exploded, coffee shops were not secure. And I think years later, a few years later, we were able to change the curve. We were able to adjust and show a very thorough focus Combined efforts held by the IDF, the General Security, the Shabak, the police, the border police, with a very good intelligence, I think we were finally managed to deal with this. We lost through the process 1,200 civilians, more than ever in our previous war. But we find a solution, and I think we restore secure I think streets and cities in Israel today are safer due to this, to this effort. It's true, though, that the Palestinians, mainly in the West, just in the West Bank, are dealing with this more and more. But, but that was not the case in the beginning. Even in the South, with the Hamas, after the Kastled operation, I think we achieved the right level of deterrence. And despite breast of violence from time to time, the level of deterrence is there. Hezbollah is more deterred. With all the criticism about the Second Lebanon War, we are witnessing an unprecedented situation in the North. Think about the simple fact that kids in the northern part of Israel, Kiryat Shmona and other places, are going to join first grade without being in, spending one night in a shelter. It's, not, it's never happened, uh, happened before. I'm not undermining not Hezbollah nor the uh, Hamas. And I think the IDF should be prepared and ready, and I'm sure that's what he does now, to another violent front. But I think, generally speaking, without going too in depth, I think we found how to be relevant in fighting this terror. And Israel is a different situation than the state. We're protecting our brothers, and uh, there are differences that we may discuss uh, later on. But I think we found an effective way to deal with terror. The the buzzword in the world, not in Israel, is coin. Those who are familiar with the coin, with the uh, counterinsurgency, may elaborate it. But in a way, we are doing this at the West Bank. And maybe we'll say a few words about it uh, later, uh, later on. The idea of using terror, uh, which I think fell, replaced another idea now in our region. Democracy, freedom, civil rights, and other issues. And I think uh, I'm referring obviously to the Arab Spring. I prefer to call it uh, the Arab Awakening. Maybe you expert in the audience uh, might uh, find another appropriate term, but I think, I think it's not an Arab Spring. It's definitely a, a struggle, and the struggle is going on. It's not been decided yet, and as we didn't see it coming, I think it will be very... Um, I think we should be very cautious in making our assessment uh, where it goes. And I'll try to uh, say my, uh, some of my uh, insight about about uh, this, uh, I think, phenomena event. It's definitely a tectonic move in the uh, region, and it started uh, even before the, uh, this change even started before the Arab Spring, the Arab uh, Awakening. Uh, the declining of the Arab uh, world, if you want, was demonstrated by, uh, the, uh, by the leaving of Mubarak even before the uh, revolution in Egypt by the um, by by the disappearing of Iraq by uh, Syria being part of the uh, um, more radical less arabic islam by the fact if you think about it by the fact that the the, the regional agenda was dictated not by an arab muslim countries it was mainly uh, about iran and turkey even before the Arab Spring. 
So on the wake of these uh, changes, we have to look and try to realize where we're going. I think the first thing that we have to say, and I want to say, that uh, nobody immune, and I think it's not over yet. Even royal families in the Gulf countries and maybe even in Jordan are still in threat. And I think it's going to be a drama if it hit some of this country. Definitely for us, it's not a good news. I think it's raised the old tension between Sunnis and Shiites, as it was demonstrated in Bahrain and elsewhere. It's raised the tension between minorities and majorities. The real dangers, I think, derive from the fact that history taught us that most revolutions were hijacked and kidnapped by more organized and, in that context, more radical group. I think that's the danger here. And it might happen, even in Egypt. Definitely in the near future, I think we will see an increase in the instability in the region and the level of uncertainty is going to increase. Egypt, it's a very important country to Israel. After Mubarak, Mubarak went, toppled down. The problem remains, some will say, even increase. Nobody knows exactly how this regime will handle with the situation. The last event in uh, the weekend, I think, have demonstrated some of the problems that they have dealing with the street. I think that the uh, military want to go back to campus, to the camp. They don't want to be exposed. They don't, want, they don't want to be in this position. The biggest problem that they have internally, I think, is how to deal with the economy. How, as they put it when we discuss it with them, to bake every morning 90 million pita bread. Investors are not willing to invest in Egypt. A Marshall Plan, we are not going to see it. And I think we have to engage with Egypt because Egypt is not just important for Israel. Traditionally, Egypt led the way to the entire Arab world. So, uh, I don't see Egypt as, as an immediate threat, but I think we have to be ready even for that and to watch very closely what's going to happen there. We have to be very careful in our, the way we deal with them. I think that the uh, security establishment, uh, the defense establishment, as well as the IDF, who has connection to the Egyptian, their role right now is increasing in restoring this relationship in keeping this situation from uh, preventing this situation from a further deterioration. And I think they are aware of this, and I think that's what they are doing. I believe to those who believe that the peace agreement between us and Egypt is an es essential and, and a vital national interest for Israel. All the alternatives are worse. With all the problems that we have with this peace, and we do, I think it's better than the alternative. I think those are who claim and argue that the uh, previous regime, Mubarak regime, let's put it this way, didn't educate it and promote the peace within Egypt, didn't prepare the younger generation for the big compromise, they are right. That's a fact. I hope it will change. But even though when you look at it from a very professional standpoint, I think the current situation, the peace agreement, is the preferred option. Syria. The struggle is going on. I think, but Syria, I think, represents an opportunity, not just a strength, at, at, at the, the, just a danger, I put it this way. I think that a new regime in, in, in Syria 
will not be the same as Assad in cooperating with Iran and Hezbollah. If, we, if Syria will be out of this axis, that will be a major blow to Iran and Hezbollah. I see how much Iran and Hezbollah are concerned with this potential development. And uh, people are throwing to me when we discuss it, well, we may have a problem in our most quiet border. I think the reason that the, that the border is quiet in, in the northern part, in the Golan Heights, is because everyone in Syria, everyone is in, in the defense establishment, in the Syrian military, and up to Bashar Assad, they know exactly what, the, what is the uh, military balance between the IDF and the, Israeli, the Syrian defense forces. That's why it's quiet. It's not because they are Zionists. <laughs> and they know exactly what would happen. Does it mean it may not happen? No. But I think that's the reason why it's not happening today. And that will continue to be the, the situation. Iran. In the beginning, I think the Iranian regime were happy with this revolution in the region. They tried to pretend that it's because what they represent. I think it's replaced with a deep concern today. First, they think they are vulnerable. Although the regime is very effective in controlling the opposition and they are spread, they are not organized, and, uh, but they are still vulnerable. Economically, the situation is not good. The uh, rising religion, religious uh, tension between Shiites and Sunnis is, is a, it's a source for concern for them. There is a big drama between the leader and the president. The president, Ahmadinejad, was his candidate to the presidency. And there is a huge struggle between them. They are highly concerned with the possibility to lose their only real state allies, Syria. They have a conflict with the Turks about the region. Both of them want to increase their hegemony in the region. They caught the intention of the Gulf countries. And uh, I think all of that represents a serious challenge to the Iranian. I don't think they are immune from this phenomenon. Fortunately, they continue with these uh, nuclear uh, projects. I think the preferred way is to deal with this through sanction. And I think uh, the best way is uh, as what Israel does right now to work with our allies and others in order to increase the sanction. I think that uh, if the Iranian will see a very high price in front of them, they may reconsider their course of action. And to those who don't believe about it, think about the fact that they already did it in the past when the Americans just announced that they are on the way to Iraq in 2003, they stopped the program. Many good things happened, by the way, if you want to judge the American posture on the region, happened in 2003. Maybe we'll discuss it through the uh, second half of this uh, presentation. And anyhow, they are vulnerable economically. They were surprised by the fact that the, uh, the, uh, uh, the U.S. were able to uh, get the Chinese and the Russian on board. But I think we, have sh we should do more. There is a huge gap between the rhetoric and the reality. When you look at the sanction, we can do more. And we can do more. If you look, my... Uh, Business professor told me, follow the money. If you look at the money, you look at the trades, the balance rate between some of the European countries and Iran, you'll see a different story. And I think we can, we can do more. And to those who doesn't want to see another option or other option, I think that's definitely the preferred way. 
The other issue is to continue to say and to be ready and, and, and to, to uh, make the Iranian believe that all the options are on the table. And I, want, I don't want to elaborate more on this issue. Turkey. I think I'm not surprised with the direction that Erdogan uh, takes Turkey. I think there is definitely a change in the Turkish orientation. I think Erdogan was very successful in removing the Kamal Atatürk uh, legacy in, the, in Turkey. I think the, the, uh, the military in a different position. I think it was a mistake to reject him, uh, reject the Turks from joining the EU, and it's kind of pushing them to the West. On the other hand, I think Turkey is still connected to the West. There are red lines even for the Turks. I think Turkey is a very important country in the region, and we have to do whatever we can, whatever is in our ends, not to deteriorate the situation furthermore. We have to work with uh, the U.S., with the European, with NATO and others to uh, restore the relationship. I know it's a huge challenge, but I think that's what we have to, uh, to do. Think about the fact that 40 years ago, the uh, only three superpowers in the region was Israel, Iran, and Turkey. All of them were allies. <clears throat> Right now, it's, uh, it's very different. Palestinians. I think two main questions are important here. Is the, or whether the uh, vote in September is avoidable? And if it's not, which I think most of you probably presume, Assuming that we're going to see the vote, is the situation afterward is containable. I think definitely the preferred way is to see negotiation. But through a lack of will or other issues, which I think might be a subject to another lecture, uh, all the players are failed to resume negotiation. And I don't give a good chance to stop the uh, Palestinian from going to, uh, to the uh, General Assembly in, uh, in the UN. Is it containable? I think yes, but I don't think that the Palestinians really want to uh, deteriorate to ter terror. I think they understand the price. I think there is a fatigue from the last intifada. I think when Palestinians in the West Bank looking outside the win window, they see a different street, a better street, not just clean and more law and order, but businesses are developing, the economy is doing better. But it's not sure. I mean, easily a demonstration, non-violent demonstration, can get out of control with no intention. And uh, from there, we can find ourselves with them in, in a situation that nobody wants. So it's a very flammable situation. I think one of the uh, anchors that may rest restrain some of these uh, um, possibilities is the uh, coordination that we have with the Palestinian Security Organization. I think through the last three or four or five years, the uh, IDF uh, and the security organization uh, have developed um, a very good coordination system, walking on the ground, which stabilized the situation. And that's an asset that we have to, to uh, maintain. What all of this mean to Israel? <clears throat> and, I, and I stop here. I think our major challenge is how to... Uh, keep the right balance between the needed military might and solving our internal problem. We uh, 
need to have a relevant military preparing to a very broad spectrum of, uh, of threat. There is a change in the nature of war. Every military today struggles with this issue. I think the IDF know that, understand it, and I hope adapt to the change. I believe we do. But it's a, it's a tough question. In this asymmetric, symmetric war, what's the uh, role of Air Force? I will still need this army as we know it. What's the changes we need, etc., etc. I think we need to maintain very efficient military capability. We must do everything that we, had, we have in order to maintain our intelligence uh, dominance, technology, technology uh, advantage, and so on. We have to uh, develop, our, to enhance our relationship with other militaries. In today's world, the only way to deal with this global threat and radical movement is by mutual and combined efforts. I think internally we have to continue with the uh, concept of what we call the nation army. I think we, only, I think we are probably the only Western society with this concept, with the draft, as it's called. I think both from quality-wise, socially-wise, and economically-wise, we cannot afford other things. We have to maintain uh, a real national service, or oh, if the, the word national is uh, offend someone a real national, a real civilian service where everyone, regardless is religious, has to serve the country. It's not just a question of security. It has to do with social justice, as it's used to say today. Finally, we have to understand there is no such thing like status quo. The landscape is changing. We have to take initiative and to take very bold, tough, crucial decisions about our borders and solving the uh, through negotiation with our neighboring country. Thank you. If you have any uh, question, I will be more than happy to answer if I know the, if I know the answer. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, could you, you said you might go back and talk about 2003 and the United States, I assume the invasion of Iraq and that sort of thing. If you could spend a few minutes on that, I'd appreciate it. I'm not. You can't hear me? No, not really. Okay. Um, I think everybody else heard me. So I'll just. Okay. I know there is a judgment in the region here, and it's not my judgment, uh, that about the American influence or posture in the region. Some are arguing that it's declining, and I'm not, I'm not saying whether it's correct or not, but I just want to give you an example, and that's the way I try to describe the change. In 2003, when the Bush, Bush administration announced that they are going to uh, Iraq, it was not a secret. I think some very positive, that's my judgment, things happened. One, the Iranians stopped their nuclear, uh, nuclear program. Second, um, Gaddafi crossed the line, gave, giving up his uh, non-conventional uh, programs and others. Assad, the son, left Lebanon. Nobody asked him. He thought it might be the next target. Even Arafat behaved differently. Some Arab countries start to, uh, with, with democratic uh, steps and others, 
And I can give you other examples. The problem is that four or five years later, we, we saw a U-turn in this, in this uh, region concerning the U.S. influence in the region. The Iranian did start their, uh, restart their uh, program. Uh, and American influence of um, yeah, American influence in the region, I, I think, was, was different. Um, I hope it will change. I think a strong America, it's important not just Israel, and vice versa. I think that the, uh, the role of the U.S. delivering goods to the, re to the world cannot be replaced by anyone. Think about this region, uh, I mean, not in a perspective, not just, uh, not just uh, through the last two, three years of this administration or other, but generally speaking, I think it's, uh, it's a major contribution to the, uh, to the stability in the world. And uh, I think in that sense, I hope the Americans will continue with their role and not moving to the extreme, from one isolation and then intervention. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's important to the world order in large. And I, I believe in a strong America, and I think this country, despite the problems that they're facing, and I'm, I've learned a lot about it just recently, I think it's still the largest economy in the world, with all the debt, debt problem and job creation and others. The world GDP is what, altogether is about $55 trillion. They are still making what, like something like 14 trillion dollars. That's mean that 340 Americans, million Americans are doing more than 3 billion Indian and, and Chinese together. They are still the uh, only military superpower in the world. They can project power everything, everywhere. Professor, uh, but their, some their, their security budget, the defense budget, is bigger than the all the defense budget on the earth together. My colleague, just to give you an example, and we have fairly, I would say, medium large military. My college, my colleagues spend my entire yearly my entirely yearly budget in less than a week. So I, I think nobody can compete there. Right now they have problems, but when you look at the history of the United States, and I'm not advocating for that, but when you look at the history of the United States, they always had the capability to reinvent themselves, and sometimes it will happen. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, my, na my name is Bassam Tibi. Uh, I was born in, in uh, Damascus, and I'm, uh, I live as a Muslim migrant in uh, Europe. And I'm an expert on Turkey. My grandfather was general in the Ottoman army. Uh, he was, uh, his name is Sadiq Basha. Yeah? And I, I lived in Turkey. I published two books uh, on the transition from Kemalism to Islamism. And my question to you, very brief, yeah? uh, uh, I had the impression uh, uh, that what the damage can be mended, what happened can be mended. And you said, uh, I quote you, uh, uh, it should be restored. I mean, the earlier. Uh, the earlier setup should be restored. Can you please uh, elaborate on this in, uh, in policy terms and consider these facts? Uh, Kemalist Turkey was based on two pillars, the, uh, the Kemalist uh, army and uh, the, the secular ju ju judiciary. As you know, uh, the command of the Turkish uh, armed forces resigned collectively last month and the Supreme Court, the secular Supreme Court, is no longer placed as it is. And Turkey has uh, not only Erdogan, but a person who is a uh, foreign minister, uh, Mr. Uh, Daoud Ulu. And Daoud Ulu is considered to be, according to New York Times, but I, I do not need to quote New York Times, I know the, my own sources, he's a neo-Ottomanist. And neo-Ottomanism means uh, a dream to restore uh, Ottoman glory. And uh, he designed a foreign policy for Erdogan, and the use of the card of anti-Israel is uh, uh, promises a payoff in the Arab world uh, to uh, to make Turkey very popular in the Arab world. So, uh, 
uh, internally, I mean in Turkey, uh, the, secular, the secular army and the secular uh, court system are undermined radically. And externally, uh, Turkey becoming very popular in the Arab world uh, uh, through, through the Israel card and it pays off. So now in, in view of these facts, how could uh, the earlier setup be restored? I try to remember the facts that you uh, <laughs> mentioned, but w what exactly you want me to answer? No, I, I, no, no. My, my question is, you, you use the term restore. Restore? Or re restore. Yeah. I think, I, think I, 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 meant, I meant very simply. I think, I think we have to do everything which is in our hands and probably oh. the uh, of course. Turks. Uh, to, uh, uh, to have a more constructive and more um, positive relationship. I don't think we are natural enemies. I, and I, and, and no, that's, um, that's my thinking now. No, I'm, you, I'm, I'm, I'm answering you. And I think we have to, to see that the, the, the current trend of relationship will not continue to deteriorate. That's what I meant. And I think it's not in Turk's interest, and I don't think it, it's an Israeli tech, uh, interest. And I'm not going purposely. I'm not going to the uh, to to deal with the recent event, uh, the flotilla and other issues. But I'm insisting that there is a change in the orientation of the uh, Turk's government m towards to the east. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very clear. You don't mean you don't need me to say. I think. I think Erdogan and mainly David Oglu, you are foreign minister, which I think is the thinker behind yeah. behind uh, uh, you uh, um, be, behind Erdogan. Uh, although he claiming for uh, zero conflict, I think his agenda is is quite different. It's very obvious to me that Turkey wants to increase its hegemony on the region and. Um, you, that's, you part, that's part of the regional diplomacy, and, um, but I don't think it should be on, on the expense of our, our relationship. And I think both sides should find a way to go back to the previous relationship that we had. I think it's more important for both countries. That's no, what I try to say. No, Thank you. Then, you think this is possible? Who's next? Yes, sir. Shela be Ivrit Bishutha. Bashwai Mahoni Pusemo with Borim. And you look like it is a Kamili Machez. I'm a little child of Nochel Abano Sazen. Ma? Cholaf Nochel Abano Sazen. Can you tell me like it is a Kamad Borim? Bakshaw, you talk to the Shela Chad. מקצר אותה. בפרסומים, מהפרסומים של השבועיים האחרונים עלו הרבה דברים על עומק וטיב הקשר בין סביבתך לבין הרפז. בין היתר, על המהם שלכאורה, בין היתר, על המהם שלכאורה סביבתך פעלה באופן אקטיבי לסיכול מינויו של יואב גלנט. דברים שסותרים את אותו נאום שהצגת במטה הכללי כשהתפוצצה הפרשה. אחד, האם זה נכון? האם באמת פעלה סביבתך נגד גלנט? ושתיים, האם אז בנאום ההוא באמת הצגת את הדברים כמו שהם? לפני שנעבור לתקשורת הישראלית, שאני מבין שזאת הסיבה שהיא באה, אז uh, אני אגיד איזה כמה מילים, האם יש עוד שאלות לגבי מה שאמרתי, אם אתה מנהל את העניינים, אז כן. תחליט. Are there any other questions here in English, and then we'll go to the Israeli press, I promise. Uh, yes, sir. Can we get a microphone over here? I am Ratib Amru from Jordan, maybe the only one from uh, Jordan and the Arab world. Uh, General, I'd like to ask you two questions. First, what do you think about uh, what uh, Dan Maridor and Uzi uh, Dayan mentioned today, uh, yesterday about the Palestinian state, that they said that there is no need for another state. They have the state in the uh, uh, East uh, Bank of Jordan. The second question, 
while you were responsible of the West Bank, you declared that King Abdullah will be the last king of the Hashemite family. Could you explain that? I have sometimes different <coughs> difficulties in explaining what I, what I said. Uh, so to explain others, uh, I, I, I think it's uh, even more challenging. But uh, if I understand you correctly, you, you're talking about this, uh, um, I think, um, old notion of Jordan as the Palestinian alternative, if I understand you correctly. I, I, I visit your country many times, both in my previous capacity uh, and, and, and other places. And uh, uh, I met with the king and others, and I know you, my previous colleague, the uh, chief of staff. I think that from an Israeli perspective, as stable Jordan as it is, it's a national interest. That's my answer to you. I think, I think it's our... Interest. That's why our relationship, defense-wise, militarily-wise, are as, as they are right now. And it's a very good relationship, as you know. Um, fighting terror, the uh, common project that we have along the border, and others issue that um, I don't think I can discuss it here in depth. But I think there's a clear understanding that uh, we have to uh, stand shoulder to shoulder and, and, and dealing with this challenging uh, together. That's my view on the uh, issue. This question is in English, Gabi, uh, for the benefit of the other people here in the crowd. Uh, given the analysis, which is a very thorough analysis about the changes that are occurring in the strategic environment, about the uncertainty, if you are, you know, put a different hat on your head now, and you were to advise the government and ask for a recommendation, uh, what would you recommend the government? Three most important issues that the IDF needs in order to maintain the degrees of freedom of action in the upcoming uncertain environment. What would be the three most important things that you would ask from the government, in other words, the political echelon, you need in order to perform the task which you defined so well to defend Israel, be able to defend Israel by itself. There is an echo here on the stage, and for some reason, if I understand you correct, that's Ranan, right? Yes. Hello, Ranan. You did all the way from Miami to uh, hear me? Uh, what I would recommend to the Israeli government, uh, and what are the... Uh, most important things to do. Well, I think that's the reason for another lecture and uh, I have to finish. I, but I use, I, not just necessarily to this government, but as a whole, uh, being in the military for uh, more than 40 years, I usually use a metaphor and I would like to share it with you. I think it's like a riding in a bus. I think everyone in, our, in, 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 in this bus um, knows exactly where is the last stop. In any issue that in hands right now, surrounding us. And instead of taking the expressway, we are making a detour, stopping on other bus stops, paying more for the tickets. And the passenger, until recently, with this Rothschild uh, uprising, until recently, didn't really care. I'm telling you this as not as the driver, as the bodyguard of this bus. And I think we have to move to the final bus stop. We strong enough, mature enough, and I think confident enough to drive this way. That's my judgment, and I think I'm very clear about the issue, and I'm not saying that it's going to be an enjoyable ride, but I think that's the necessary road to take. Thank you. About the uh, question, 
אלון ואני מניח הכתבים האחרים לגבי הפרסומים האחרונים. תראו, התייחסתי לזה גם כשהגעתי ב- לארץ בשדה התעופה, אני רוצה לומר כמה דברים. כל חיי שירתי בצבא, מאז גיל 14 השתתפתי, הצטרפתי לפנימייה הצבאית. 40 שנה אני משרת בצה"ל, זה... השירות הביטחוני זה תמצית סיפור חיי. אני מרגיש זכות גדולה וגאווה גדולה בכל אשר עשיתי. לפני למעלה מארבע שנים, בנסיבות שלא צפיתי, קיבלתי את תפקיד הרמטכ"ל. אחרי שפרשתי. מאז עסקתי יחד עם חבריי למטה הכללי, עם המפקדים בצה"ל, עם החיילים, בסדיר ובמילואים ובקבע כמובן, בחיזוק כוחו של צה"ל ובהגנה על מדינת ישראל. עסקנו בזה בכל מה שקשור לתחומי האימונים, שיפור הכשירות, חיזוק האימון בתוך צה"ל ובצה"ל עצמו, שיפור מערך המילואים, שיפור המודיעין, ההצטיידות, הטכנולוגיה והכנת צה"ל לתפקיד העיקרי שלו, צבא קיים לצורך מלחמה. עשינו את זה הן בכל מה שקשור להפעלת הכוח והן בכל מה שקשור לבניין הכוח. אני יכול לומר לכם שלא עסקנו לא בכתיבת מכתבים ולא בקשירת קשרים. המשטרה, כמו שידוע לכם, חקרה את הפרשה של המסמך וקבעה את תוצאתה, שלא הפתיע אותי, שאף אחד בצה"ל לא היה מעורב בכתיבת המכתב הזה וגם לא בזיופו, ואני אומר לכם, גם לא בהדלפתו. לכן אני החלטתי לנהוג כבר בתחילת הפרשה באופן הבא, אחד, לשתף פעולה ולתבוע שתהיה חקירה שתרד עד לכל האמת, בכל הרמות ואת כולם, בשביל להבין מאיפה הוא הגיע לעולם ומה באמת היה כאן. ואני שמח שכך קבעה המשטרה, ואני יכול לומר לכם ש... אני גם שמעתי את הודעת היועץ המשפטי משבוע שעבר, וגם שמעתי ב... וראיתי בטלוויזיה את מי שערך את החקירה ומה הוא אמר. הדבר השני, אנחנו משתפים פעולה עם כולם, כך היה עם הצבא, כך היה אז, ואני משתף פעולה גם עכשיו ועם כל מי שצריך, ואני לא מפחד מלעשות את הדבר הזה. הדבר השלישי, אני לא מתכוון להצטרף לה... ולהיגרר אחרי המסע הזה שנעשה. שכוונותיו ברורות לי, הוא רצוף אמירות לא נכונות ומניפולטיביות. ויש לי אמון מלא באמת במוסדות החקירה במדינת ישראל, לא רק במשטרת ישראל ולא רק בפרקליטות, בפרקליטות ובעץ המשפטי, אלא גם במבקר המדינה, שבודק את כל הפרשה על כל היבטיה, מתהליך מינוי הרמטכ"ל, מהיחסים בין לשכת שר הביטחון ולשכת הרמטכ"ל, וגם בהיבטים המסוימים או השונים של... מכתב ערפז. שמחתי לשמוע את הודעתו של המבקר שכל הטענות יופיעו בגוף הביקורת. הוא עושה עבודה רצינית ואני בטוח שהוא וצוותו ישפכו אור על הפרשה. עד אז אני החלטתי לא להתייחס לזה מעבר לכך. אני יכול לומר לכם שאם במילה סביבתי מתכוונים לאשתי, אז גם אשתי נחקרה. זה לא נעים, אבל היא נחקרה, כולל בפרשת המסמך וגם לבקשתה עברה בדיקת פוליגרף, נמצאה דוברת אמת. אני יכול אבל להישיר מבט אליך, אלון, כמו שאמרתי לך גם בעבר, ואני אומר לך גם עכשיו. אנחנו בוודאי בצבא, אני לא מכיר מישהו שקשור לכתיבת המכתב הזה ולהבאתו לעולם ולא לזיופו, ובוודאי בצה"ל שאתה מכיר ואני מכיר, אין קושרים ולא עסקנו בקשרים. תודה רבה לכם. Special thanks to Gabi Ashkenazi for addressing us. Uh, tomorrow, what time do we start, Orit? 10.30. 10.30.